Great. So hello and welcome everybody to um, the Jerome Foundation's Jerome Hill Artist Fellowship CV session. Today we'll be discussing best practices for preparing your CV and thanks everyone for joining. And you may have noticed that your line has been muted and your video is off by default. Um, and to ask your questions, we ask that you do it through the chat. So you can click that chat button in your menu bar. You can also click the live transcript option to have a closed captioning. This is done by a computer, so it won't be 100% accurate, but a corrected closed caption will be there for the recording of this session. And that recording will be on our website on the events page. We currently have the fellowship overview and fellowship application webinars available to view on that page as well. Hi all. And we wanna let you know that we are joining you today from Minnesota Makoche also called Minnesota. This is the homeland of the Dakota people. Today, there are 11 tribes, including four Dakota and seven Anishinaabe. And at Jerome, we honor and respect the tribal sovereignty, rights, and cultural resilience of the many native and indigenous peoples connected to this land, as well as the lands of the Lenape, Munsee, and Canarsi, and many other tribes in what is uh, today called New York City. I'm Eleanor Savage. I'm the program director at Jerome Foundation. And my pronouns are, I'm very flexible. <laughs> Anything respectful. Um, you will, uh, for a visual description, I'm uh, white skinned, of Scots Irish descent, have short cropped hair, black glasses, I'm wearing a black sweater on this chilly Minnesota day with a, a black and gray scarf. And I'm in a yellow room with a big window off to the side and a very busy bookshelf with plants and books and all kinds of things. And I'll pass to Andrea for introduction. Hi, I'm Andrea Brown. I'm the Grants and Program Administrator at Jerome Foundation. Um, I use she, her pronouns. I am a uh, white scale, white skinned, uh, short, dark hair, black glasses. I'm wearing a black sweater and have some black headphones on. Um, I'm sitting in a light gray room and behind me are some bookshelves and um, a reading chair. And I'll pass along to Melissa. Thanks, Andrea. Hi, everybody. I'm Melissa Levin, and I am a program associate with the Jerome Foundation, and I am based in New York City. My pronouns are she, her, and for a visual description, I am a white-skinned woman of Jewish and Eastern European descent with medium length brown hair um, with some gray in it and bangs um, that go straight across my forehead. I am wearing a light blue button down shirt and I have on bright red lipstick and I'm sitting in my home office, which uh, on one side of me, I have a bookshelf filled with books and plants and other objects and ephemera. And on the other side, um, there's a light pink wall with some framed artwork and postcards hanging. And I will now pass to Lara. Hi, everybody. My name is Laura Mimosa Montez. Pronouns are she, her. For a visual description, I am a light-skinned Puerto Rican woman with commercial ready, curly, cropped hair. <laughs> <laughs> I could be in a Pantene commercial. Um, and I'm in an office space in Minnesota on a cozy gray couch with white walls and some text-based artworks behind me. Thank you all. And so you'll see the rest of the Jerome staff here on screen, our president, Ben Cameron, and our finance team, Coretta Hend Kendricks and Lori Luan. So we have an hour session today on CVs, and we want to provide some general information and best practices and tips for preparing your artist CV. Uh, for the purposes of applying to professional grants and fellowship opportunities in the arts, including this Jerome Hill Artist Fellowship, which is currently now open 
through May 4th. We will specify the information that pertains directly to Jerome's CV request. And also when we're sharing tips that apply more broadly. I want to note that it's always important to read thoroughly and follow guidelines for any opportunity that you're seeking. Jerome, we have our own like particular requests and other uh, organizations do as well. So feel free to drop your questions in to the chat as we move through everything today. Uh, before we dive into CVs, I want to just give you the highlights of the Jerome Hill Artist Fellowship Program for those of you who haven't um, uh, kind of gone into depth around that. Uh, this is a, um, oops, I lost my place here. Hold on. Okay. The Jerome Hill Fellowship supports a diverse range of early career generative artist based in Minnesota or the five boroughs of New York City. It's a grant of $25,000 per year for two consecutive years for a total of $50,000. And this is flexible funding. So artists decide for themselves their two-year plan and how to allocate the funds for the creation and presentation of new work, artistic development, and or professional artistic career development. The funds uh, support grantees to take risks, explore new ideas, and investigate professional and artistic activities. And we expect to award a total of 63 fellowships across eight fields that are listed here on the slide. Within each field, the foundation supports a wide range of aesthetics, forms, and creative practices and lineages, as well as points of view. We applaud experimentation and interdisciplinarity within each field. And the first step in applying to any grant or fellowship is to make sure that you're eligible for that particular opportunity. And each foundation or granting organization has their own specific criteria, as I mentioned previously. If you're interested in learning more about the Jerome Hill Artist Fellowship, we encourage you to visit the website. Uh, where you can view past info sessions and read in greater detail about the fellowship. And Andrea is going to drop that link into the chat now. You can also schedule a call with Jerome program staff to review your eligibility. And we'll share details about how to contact us toward the end of the session. I'm gonna hand over now to Melissa. Thanks, Eleanor. So I am going to continue talking about uh, the fellowship more generally as we talk about the application components. So typically CVs are one part of any, almost any professional application process. And for the Jerome Hill Artist Fellowship application, the CV is one of five total components and it is a very important one. This is because Jerome staff and panelists will refer to your CV for multiple purposes. And the first is that staff, it helps staff determine your eligibility related to your career stage. We rely on your CV to confirm that your generative artistic practice is within the eligible two to 10 year time frame for the fellowship. And second, we confirm that you have at least two completed and publicly presented works. Um, and those are works that cannot be self-produced or created in a degree granting program, which is also an eligibility requirement for the fellowship. And further to that, panelists refer to your CV to gain an understanding of your generative work and of the trajectory of your entire artistic practice over time. So that being said, in addition to the CV in the fellowship application, we also require some basic information. And this will include how you describe your artistic practice in your own words. Uh, we have required and optional work samples, which are accompanied by additional contextual information. Um, we require responses to three core questions, which invite you to share who you are, what you are working on, and where you are directing your creative energies. And finally, we ask for some basic demographic and contact information. 
We do not ask for a couple of things. We do not ask applicants to provide uh, fellowship plans or budgets for the panel to consider and only awarded fellows are asked for these plans and budgets after they have been approved by the Jerome Foundation Board of Directors. We also don't ask for references or letters of recommendation. And again, for all of the details on eligibility and application submission, including field specific work sample specifications, um, refer to the link that Andrea just dropped in the chat. And I will pass it now to Lara. Great, thanks. So diving right in, we wanted to start by taking a look at the differences and similarities between a CV and a resume. You'll see a CV here on the left of the slide and a resume on the right. As you compare them, think of the CV as your comprehensive history, um, whereas the resume is a fluid document that you tailor to emphasize specific experiences related to a particular opportunity. In fact, as Andrea had shared with me earlier this week, <laughs> a CV is an abbreviation for curriculum vitae, which can be loosely translated from Latin as the course of one's life. The word resume comes from the French word resume, meaning summary. I feel like I can go on Jeopardy now. <laughs> <laughs> So both CVs and resumes are used to apply for professional and career opportunities. Both tell your story in outline form. Some opportunities such as the Jerome Fellowship or teaching positions ask for the CV with your entire professional history. Other grants and jobs uh, might request a resume that is narrowed to your specific experience related to a particular opportunity and some resume requests will even set a one or two page limit. The Jerome Hill Artist Fellowship requires a CV because we want panelists to have a comprehensive understanding of an artist's work over time. Um, kind of to build off of what Melissa had said, it's key for panelists to know an artist's past experiences, what they're working on and where and how they're directing their creative energies. A highlights or resume document um, leaves too much information and context out. So again, you know, emphasizing this opportunity, we're requiring a CV for the fellowship. Um, resumes emphasize skills and responsibilities and are organized into categories for easy scanning by the reader. Resumes are more typically used for job applications, like I just mentioned, um, and they can be modified, edited, and reorganized based on the specific opportunities you're applying to. Note that there are instances, though, where foundations or arts organizations will request a resume in an application. They might also even use the terms resume and CV interchangeably. For instance, the Minnesota State Arts Board, um, as well as the Creative Capital, uh, opportunities ask for resumes. Again, trying to be clear, the Jerome Foundation requests you submit a CV. So that's where we're focusing um, the energy in our discussion today. Okay, so again, CVs emphasize comprehensive records of accomplishments and awards. Um, and they're more commonly used to apply to fellowships, grants, and open calls. There's no limit, uh, page limit for a CV. One best practice that we generally recommend is to continually maintain your CV, adding to the list everything you do in your career, something like a running tab. From this source CV, you might then go on to create different kinds of specialized CVs and resumes. For example, one might be shaped for exhibition, performance, publication opportunities, while another might be used to apply for jobs or freelance situations, or to stress your activities as an educator, producer, curator, or critic. Generally speaking, CVs are created, formatted, and regularly updated using software such as word processing applications like Microsoft Word or Pages, or Google Docs and Google Drive, or WPS Office Free. In most cases, you'll want to export or save this document to a PDF. That way, all your formatting spaces, et cetera, will be maintained. 
and I'll pass it over to Melissa to get into more detail about what items you'll want to include on these CVs. Great. Thank you, Laura. Um, and I just want to say again, as we get into these basics on what to include, that a lot of this, if it's helpful to you, can be widely applicable to CVs that you'll use in other instances. Um, and also a lot of what we say will be specific to the things that we're looking for as we review Jerome Hill Artist Fellowship applications. Um, so, um, <laughs> So here we, sorry, <laughs> there's some noisiness around my apartment. So please excuse any banging or music that comes in through my windows and doors. Um, okay, so we'll start with starting at the beginning. We start with, um, with your name. And for uh, the fellowship, we actually don't require a legal name, just the common artist name you are known by. And then also some basic contact information. So, um, it's important to include your email address and your phone number. And especially um, because the Jerome Foundation's funding is focused on artists who are residing in the state of Minnesota and in the five boroughs of New York City, we do look for a Minnesota or New York City address um, at the top of your CV and elsewhere in the application form. Um, so that's an important note, uh, especially for this fellowship application. Um, there might be instances, for example, where you don't want to include your full address on a CV or resume, and that would be your choice. But here, we, um, we want to see that Minnesota or New York City address. Uh, also, if you have an artist website, this is the place to put it, and you can provide that website address here. Next um, is to include any formal educational degrees that you may have completed, and those can be a BA, BFA, MA, MFA, or a PhD. And we ask that you include both enrollment and graduation dates. We really want to emphasize that it's important, uh, again, for the for the Jerome Hill Artist Fellowship that you do include start and end dates for any completed degrees, because that information can be helpful to us in determining your eligibility for the fellowship. Um, we also encourage you to include any trainings that might be relevant to your creative practice or to your artistic career. And all of that being said about formal education and training, we do want to emphasize that you are not required to have any formal education or field specific degrees to be eligible for or apply for this fellowship. Next, um, be sure to include any previous awards, grants, fellowships, or residencies that you may have received. Um, even if you have declined these awards, it's important to include them. Again, um, on the CVs for this fellowship, we're really looking for as full a picture as possible of your entire artistic practice and career trajectory. Um, this is also the place to put if you have received any finalist awards or honorable mentions that are publicly announced. Um, you can put those here as well. <laughs> Next is a record of professional credits. So this will include any history of publications, completed works, screenings and festivals, recordings, performances, commissions, releases, solo and group exhibitions, any of the activities that comprise your professional artistic practice and, uh, and career. And for these professional credits, it's really important to include pertinent information like the title, um, the date, especially the name of the presenting, publishing, exhibiting, screening, uh, organization or venue, or if a project is self-produced, if that's applicable to you. And also include the length or scope or scale of the work. And depending on your field, this might be stated in terms, uh, in different terms. So it might be stated in terms of minutes or hours for time-based work, uh, might be a page count for text-based work, and exhibition context for visual work, such as if an exhibition is a solo group or public exhibition. 
It's really key, again, that you include these details because Jerome program staff, uh, especially initially, will review your history of publicly presented or published works in order to help determine your eligibility, as I said before, and also because it helps panelists better understand your artistic practice. And we'll continue to discuss that in greater detail momentarily. Finally, um, Please also include any forthcoming confirmed projects or commissions that are currently under contract, even if they have yet to take place. And you can put the planned presentation, publication, or release date uh, along with that. If you also have work that has been completed but has yet to be presented, um, you can include that either in the list of works that I just described in the previous section, um, or you can list that here. We just want to make sure that you have the opportunity to share information about forthcoming work, confirmed works and projects. Um, and just a general note that the order of this information is really entirely up to you where you place uh, education or the record of grants and awards or the record of presented works, um, except for your name and contact info, which of course should go at the top of the first page. And I'm going to hand it back to Lara to talk about some best practices. Great, thank you. So here are a few items you would not include on a CV, particularly if you're applying for this fellowship. Employment unrelated to your artistic practice. A note here, as the applicant, you would be the best judge in determining what is unrelated to your artistic practice. Um, we also don't want to encourage you to include images or personal photographs or additional work samples. In addition, links to additional content um, like work samples or social media sites, since panelists will not review outside links beyond those included in the work sample section of the application fields in submittable. We also encourage you not to spend time creating a CV with overly complicated or eye-catching design elements like a border or different colors. We want to encourage you to save your creativity for your work. I'll hand it back to Melissa to speak a bit more about um, categorizing your work. Great, thanks, Lara. So as we've mentioned a couple of times for this fellowship, program staff and panelists are going to review your CV to understand your work as a generative artist. Um, and that is work that you will have developed from conception to presentation. And in order to most clearly represent this, we also further recommend organizing the information in your CV with as much kind of distinction and clarity as possible in this realm. So um, especially if you are an artist who has worn multiple hats as a generative artist, and also, for example, as a collaborator, performer, designer um, on another artist's work, it is really essential to distinguish these two types of work um, from each other. So we recommend creating clear sections to categorize your work, beginning with the list of works for which you are the generative artist and using a clear section heading such as generative artistic work. And if you play multiple roles in your own work, such as choreographer and performer, playwright and actor, list all of the roles that you play with the corresponding work. And um, this slide here is giving some field specific examples of the roles that you might be playing um, both in your own work and or if you're a collaborator on other people's work as well. And the reason that we ask you to do this is because, again, it takes all of the guesswork um, out of the review for both Jerome staff and the panels that we convene to review applications. Mm -hmm. In addition, you are also welcome and encouraged to list works in which you have played a significant role, but were not the lead generative artist. And we recommend doing this under a separate section heading, such as other artistic activity, and maybe we can even go to the next slide, Andrea, just, um, yeah, so there it is, um, uh, the way that you might consider listing these 
uh, these might be works in which you were a dancer, a set designer, or an editor, but not the lead generative artist, again, that being the choreographer, director, or writer, for example. Separating your work in these roles, uh, with these roles in mind, is really immensely helpful um, for all of our review, both staff and panelists. We also want to make a note here about collaborators. It is especially important um, if you are applying as a collaborative or a collective that you make sure that you and your co-applicants reflect all of your corresponding roles as collaborators across all of your individual CVs. It is additionally helpful in certain in instances and depending on your artistic field to include different categories within your generative work. For example, if you are a visual artist, we recommend separate listings for solo exhibitions, two-person exhibitions, group exhibitions, and or commissions. For writers, this might look like separating your full-length books from chapbooks or anthologies from magazine credits. For filmmakers, list shorts separately from features. For dancers, clearly list evening length works, et cetera. Again, this will look different for each field. And again, here you can see an example of the categorizations I'm describing with generative artistic work clearly listed separately from other related artistic activity. Um, and this slide also shows sections for talks and lectures, as well as teaching and workshops, which Laura will go into further detail now. Thanks. So as we've already talked about education, if that's applicable in your case, and the importance of dates, and the names of colleges or universities, etc. And Melissa discussed using section headings for various types of generative work. Again, you'll want to organize your generative accomplishments into different sections with appropriate headings, like Melissa just mentioned, and laid with your most recent work and accomplishments. Here's a longer list of section headings you will want to include on your CV as they're applicable to you and your practice. So following education and the different types of generative work, there's works in development, um, especially those under contract fellowships and awards received, grants or previous funding history, residencies you might have attended or um, are planning on attending, curatorial work, non-generative creative work, arts-related teaching or related employment mm -hmm. or professional and or work for higher experience in your field. Here's a few optional items you might inc consider including on a CV. Want to highlight that these items are not required to establish eligibility, but we're sharing them because past applicants have included these sections on their CVs as a way to help review panels gain greater context for your overall artistic practice. So some optional items might include a brief blurb that summarizes your artist practice or identity as a maker, as short as one or two sentences is fine. Um, a list of artist talks and lectures, again, this is optional. Service or other relevant volunteer experience. And lastly, a list or links to publicity about your work, um, including interviews, audio, TV, web, print, perhaps a bibliography of published reviews and other press. Again, this might be helpful if you're applying for other grants or jobs, but it's not material that will be considered in this fellowship application review process. I'll pass it over to Eleanor to speak in some greater detail about best practices for formatting. Okay, so these, um, these formatting suggestions really apply uh, across the board, not just specific to Jerome. Uh, so lead with your most recent work and accomplishments and list items within a section in reverse chronological order. So as, as both Melissa and Laura have talked about, you wanna start with your most recent work. Uh, use clear and concise and consistent descriptions for all listings of work and accomplishments. And just make it easy to read. Uh, and you want to be sure that all of the information is up to date and accurate. 
Uh, we also recommend including the page numbers on the bottom of your CVs with your name. Uh, again, for ease of reference for staff and panelists. And check for consistent and readable fonts using an 11 or, or 12 point font. Sans serif is typically easier to read. Remember, CVs do not need um, special formatting or flourishes. It, it's really about just as concisely and concisely and clearly as possible communicating the information. Uh, pay attention to length. For Jerome, we have no minimum or maximum length. Other opportunities may have a page limit or a request of one to two page highlights resume. And at Jerome, we, we want a comprehensive view of your artistic practice and career direct, traje, trajectory. <laughs> uh, and as Melissa said, you, know, you want to make a PDF version that preserves the formatting uh, like you want it. Some text files, when you open in a different platform than the one that it was created in, get all wonky. And uh, that doesn't do you or anybody else any favors. So I think that's it for our like tips and uh, around formatting and what to include. Uh, we want to talk a little bit more about Jerome eligibility and how uh, we are, you know, using your CV, and that we've we've mentioned this at the top of the our conversation. But just to reaffirm, the program staff will review your CV to verify that you're not enrolled in a degree granting program, that you're not a tenured professor or the equivalent, and that you have at least two completed and publicly presented works. And this is outside of work created in a degree granting program. And both of these works must have been produced, commissioned, or presented by an outside organization, such as a publisher, curator, editor, or so on, and not self-produced or self-presented or self-published, such as on a social media channel like TikTok or Instagram or your personal website. And program staff also review CVs to ensure that you're within that two to ten year, uh, two to ten years of practice as a generative artist. And if we're not able to confirm your eligibility due to questions around your CV, then the rest of your application will not be considered or forwarded to the review panel. I'm going to hand it back to Melissa now to talk about who's reviewing your CV. Thanks, Eleanor. Um, so as we've said uh, also a few times, uh, for the Jerome Hill Artist Fellowship, CVs are first reviewed by program staff, and this is to confirm all of the eligibility requirements that Eleanor just went over. Upon confirming an applicant's eligibility, all eligible applications are then forwarded on to field-specific review panels, and as we've also said a couple of times, the panelists then further use your CV to get to know you and your work as an artist better. Um, we have review, uh, our review panels are field specific for all eight application fields and are comprised of arts professionals and artists, um, often past fellows with the experience and understanding of uh, either or both Minnesota and New York City early career artists. Um, panelists have wide ranging knowledge that encompasses a depth and breadth of aesthetics, methodologies, practices, and ways of working and presenting work in various genres, forms, and styles. You can actually see many of our past Jerome Foundation panelists on the website if you do want to learn more about who is serving on these panels, and Andrea will drop that link in the chat. Thanks, Andrea. And then we also wanted to note that, um, of course, for other non-Jerome funded opportunities, um, just so you have a sense of uh, other types of review panels that may be put together um, in addition to program staff review panels 
for other types of opportunities like residencies, fellowships, and other grants might also include selected volunteers or community members. They could include paid professionals in the field at both local and national levels and or as I also mentioned, former awardees for specific opportunities. And back to Andrea. Yeah, so hopefully we've given you some things to think about and, and food for thought. And if you have questions, um, please go ahead and drop them into the chat. Um, I am not seeing any at the moment, but here they come. So I'm gonna stop the share here. And the question is, do both bodies of work have to be exhibited in full or can they be finished bodies of work that got exhibited publicly in parts only? So let's say like a photograph was part of one exhi exhibition and another photograph was part of another exhibition and so on. And I'll, I can start this and please chime in, um, colleagues. Um, so I, I think the answer here in this specific instance is that as long as you've shown the work in public uh, in publicly presented settings uh, and it's been selected or curated by an outside entity um, or a person like a curator, um, that yes, that uh, it's fine that they are not that they are exhibited in parts and not exhibited in full together. Um, and so again, yes, we encourage you to just be explicit and clearly state how works are being shown and what exhibit exhibitions they're being included in. Um, you know, if it's relevant to name the curator, you can do that or name, uh, again, name the venue where the works are being exhibited. And um, yeah, I'll just note here, we're not going to, we're not getting into detail on other aspects of the applications, but we do uh, want to note that there are different requirements once you get into the work samples submissions. Um, so things will look different, you know, for your options to submit work samples. But for the CV, it's important, yes, to um, to note the works that you've exhibited and where you've exhibited them. And I think just to reiterate that um, bodies of work, you know, that are finished don't need to be exhibited fully together as long as you show that they were publicly presented. Yeah, one of the helpful things in the additional information that you might list if something is in a group exhibition, if you have like one or two or three works in a group exhibition, it's sometimes helpful to just note that, um, you know, that's really different than if you have, you know, like 20 or 30 works in a, in a you know, maybe a two-person exhibition or something like that. So that information just gives the panel more a sense of the um, kind of scale um, or, or depth of the experience for you. Another question here, uh, can you place your grants, fellowships, publicity, et cetera, under the generative work itself that it's sort of associated to, um, if that is attached to a specific project? Or do you want the fellowships, publications, and generative work separated out and sort of in their own kind of standalone sections? I've seen this um, information presented both ways very clearly. Um, and I, you know, it, it also sometimes depends on the field that you're working in. Um, I know filmmakers tend to, I, I see this more commonly on film resumes that they'll list a film and then all of the screenings and festivals and any awards associated with a particular film. Uh, I think as long as it's really clear um, it, I don't think there's a right or a wrong way, and I would yield to my colleagues here as well. I would agree with you, Eleanor. I've seen on film CVs um, that, yeah, they're organized differently, you know, so take your field into account as you apply these best practices. Um, you know, one thing we didn't say um, that occurs to me, but I guess in you know, the best way to have a sense too um, of just like how CVs might look in your field is, you know, see like um, 
sometimes peers have their own CVs uploaded on um, their professional websites or your pr professors or former professors or mentors. Um, that's one way in which I've gone to like see resources of like, how do people format their CVs in my field generally, um, whether it's film or writing or visual art. And so looking at um, a professor's CV to see kind of best practices or standards has been helpful as well as sometimes being on a review panel. So we didn't talk about that, but I just wanted to throw that out there. I'll just add one other thing, um, which is that I think you know, some of our primary advice, no matter how, you know, how you decide to categorize your work is that just clarity, consistency, and including all of the relevant information. So however you decide to list it, um, you know, choose that and then do so consistently. So if you're going to list, you know, if you want to list works with all of the accolades or information for that work, then do that for every work rather than, um, you know, then having a separate section uh, that, you know, might be more confusing to uh, staff or panelists who are reviewing. And just to note on the scale, you know, staff and panelists might be reviewing dozens at a time. Um, so making yours kind of easy and clear to decipher um, is just gonna make everybody's lives a lot, a lot better. Um, so moving on, if you already have two or more publicly presented works, do these have to be the samples, the work samples that you use in the application? Um, or can you include work that has been completed but not yet exhibited? Yeah, I can answer that. Um, so the, the eligibility requirement is different than our work sample requirements. And we intentionally uh, don't require that the work samples be the same as the eligibility requirement. Um, for the work samples, we want you to submit what you feel is your strongest work and the samples that are gonna best represent you in terms of uh, the information that you're sharing in the rest of the application. And this may or may not be work that has been publicly presented. Um, uh, but we do ask for work samples of completed work. Uh, and it can be either presented or not, or published or not. Um, and at least one of the samples uh, has to be work that was completed outside of a degree program. And one of the other samples can be, could, could include work that is created while you're in a degree program. Um, but there's a lot more detailed information about work samples in the uh, 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 application uh, guide. And I think, Andrea, have you shared that link? Uh, no, I will. Maybe. I will find that and I will put it in the <laughs> surprise <chat>. links. Um, <laughs> But we are also going to do a, a work sample uh, session kind of similar to this CV session um, on, can someone help me with the date? I can't remember the date. The seven, oh. March 17th. March 17th, yes. Same time, same mm -hmm. station. <laughs> Um, and while I keep on hunting for that link, I'm gonna move on to the next question. Is a CV with relatively few completed works a disadvantage, even if it meets that two public showings requirement? And is it taken into account how much time it might take an artist to complete a single work? Um, it's not a, a disadvantage um, as long as you, know, you meet the, eligibility requirements. Uh, you know, we, we say that we fund artists between two to 10 years uh, in their generative practice, and we, we mean that. Um, and we encourage the panels to uh, fund a diversity of um, people at different, we think of career stage as a spectrum, early career as a spectrum, people at the two year, you know, and then all the way through to the 10 year uh, stage. So um, if you have specific information about like the amount of time that it takes to complete your work, 
you, you'll want to include that and talk about that um, more explicitly in the core questions that we ask. Um, and, you know, I'm sure that your, um, you know, work samples will, will, might reflect some of that information as well. Also add that it, oh, that work, we definitely understand that just generally in any field, artists work in different ways and also understand field to field that depending on your field, it might take, projects might take longer, you know, from conception to realization um, than in other fields. And so we, you know, of course, take that into account as well. You've got a few questions coming up about kind of live performances and people playing different roles. So for live performance, uh, does it help to go into detail regarding the roles people have played? For example, I did a residency and I invited another artist to be a part of the residency. And then there was a live performance that was presented at the end of the residency. Um, so I think the question, maybe if we can answer this question both, if you are um, a part of someone else's performance, how you might reflect that on a CV, um, or if you were in a residency and you completed a, a work and presented it during your residency, how does that kind of factor into your um, completed works that you might list? Yeah, I think that if you, um, in terms of the role, so if, if you're the generative artist, um, you'd want to list this under your, you know, generative artistic work. And I mean, you can, you, you, it's fine to include a sentence or two kind of describing, you know, how that work was, um, you know, that, that it was a residency and you did a, a performance at the end of the residency inviting other artists to join you. Um, I think it's really good to spell out those roles. Uh, if you were, you know, collaborators, you'd want to, you know, include that under collaboratively created work, if that, if that's the nature of, of this situation, or if you are a performer in someone else's work, then uh, we talked about, you know, including other artistic work. And in, in that context, you, you can, you know, talk about uh, work that you've done where you were a dancer or performer, um, you know, basically any of the uh, kind of non-generative roles that you might want to play. Anyone else want to tag on to that? I don't know if it would be helpful to have that slide again, Andrea, where the different roles for the fields are um, available on the CVs that I've seen. Um, you know, someone indicates they'll have the title of a work, for example, and sometimes in brackets, they'll have a note saying that they're, you know, the choreographer and the dancer. And then they might have another person's name is like just the dancer. So sometimes indicating those roles in that way. Um, it's not always just based on sections, um, but sections is a good starting point. Um, meaning like those kind of larger subheadings, not just including it next to the title of the work, your role. Another question um, for co-generative works. Um, for example, uh, this artist is serving as musical director uh, and or arranger for a performance. I'm struggling with how to note or where to put when I've performed in an entire kind of full length concert but was only in charge um, as the arranger or director of one of the pieces in the entire event? Should I list the single piece of work in one place and my performance within an ensemble for the entire concert somewhere else? I've seen artist CVs where it appears as if they've listed things a bit overlaid to do something like this, or should I just list it once and then just write out the various roles that I had within the larger full length uh, concert itself? That's a lot to digest. Um, I would say, um, I think, you know, the options that you've laid out, uh, you know, listing it, listing the, 
the piece that you were the generative artist for under the, you know, work that generative artist, artistic work. Um, I would not list the whole concert there um, because it might be confusing. The panel might think, uh, you know, might just might be confused about why you're listing the whole concert versus you know, a, a single composition that you are responsible for. Um, I think also in, uh, in terms of Jerome's definition of generative, um, we wouldn't define arranging, um, uh, arranging work or, um, being a musical director for a concert as you know a, a generative experience, and so I would you know move this to that you know kind of other artistic work uh, category. Category. Another question, more about the fellowship and less about the CV. But um, what are some of the commitments, required meetings, things like that? Uh, if someone is chosen as one of the grantees in this program and are those in person? Um, there, we, we have a orientation uh, with all of the fellows. Uh, we, we bring everyone together. Um, I don't know that we've made a decision about whether this will be in person or live uh, as, as things are have been radically changing um, due to COVID, but um, there is potential that it could be live if, if that is safe and possible. Um, it could also be virtual, um, but we, we go into details about all of the things that you need to know, um, how to create your plan and budget, uh, contracting, all of that kind of thing. That's the only required uh, meeting. We also offer um, some financial planning workshops, which are virtual. And uh, there's other, uh, other things that we offer. I don't want to take up too much time with that here. Um, uh, we did uh, go into that uh, in the overview uh, session and the recording for that is available. Um, so I would encourage you to kind of take a look at that. And there's a, there's a section in that overview document that goes into detail about um, the requirements and everything. A question here, uh, I think related to related work. Um, I've seen a CV where a person had a section where they listed all the ensembles that they were a member of, like kind of an ongoing member of an ensemble as opposed to just hired for one-off gigs and listing things that way. Um, have you seen how people treat this in a CV? And do you have a preference in terms of showing membership in an ensemble versus and or showing gigs that that ensemble did? Um, I think that it's, it's helpful to give some sense of you know, kind of the scale of your work with an ensemble. So if you're uh, part of an ensemble and you're kind of performing and touring, you don't need to list like, you know, 85 <laughs> uh, places that you've gone to, you know, over the years, but um, it might be just, you know, a sentence to say, I'm, you know, like actively touring uh, and performing with this ensemble and, you know, we're doing dozens of shows a year or some, something like that, just kind of summarize. Um, uh, and it, I think it is helpful to um, share, you know, kind of all of the, the groups that you're working with, all of the bands or ensembles. Maybe I'll just add the same note that I made before, which is that this, uh, I think this also is um, kind of up to your preference and how it reflects your practice. 
and that however you choose to list, just do so again with consistency and, and clarity. So if you do decide to have a list of, you know, if you're an ensemble member with multiple um, ensembles or bands, you know, that you're listing those kind of consistently in the same way um, as Eleanor just described. Okay, if our generative work began more than 10 years after the conclusion of our education in a similar or adjacent field, would the graduation date disqualify, disqualify us from being an early career generative artist? I can chime in and just answer. It sounds like maybe an eligibility call <laughs> might be in order for this situation. Um, you know, determining whether someone is in that early career um, moment of, you know, being a generative creative maker and artist. Sometimes the CV is the most helpful way of addressing that. Um, so, you know, we'll, we'll get shortly to the information about how to, um, get in touch with us and um, book an eligibility call. But yeah, it's hard to say in the, in like with the information provided in the chat, you know, whether you are or not uh, eligible. So I'd say, stay tuned to see how you can get in touch with us and um, do an eligibility call. Spoiler, I just put it in. <laughs> Can't wait. Um, okay. Uh, Someone is wondering if this would be an example of a generative work, a screenplay written by a filmmaker that has placed in national competitions, but has not been produced as a film yet. Uh, no, uh, we, for uh, film, and this, there's a really great uh, section in the overview document uh, that goes into detail about uh, you know, kind of field by field, the generative roles. Uh, you, we, we are supporting the directors, film directors who are creating their own original film work. Um, and we, we don't uh, fund screenwriting explicitly. Okay. Uh, my formal educational degrees are not in the arts. Should I still include them? My formal education and background um, in this case, in international relations, the Middle East and Arabic definitely inform my approach to printmaking. I would definitely include anything that is um, informs your work as an artist. Uh, we've had uh, artists who, you know, for example, are um, kind of a tech centered artists who have a background in science and their degree is in um, completely not artistic, but that that background informs uh, their work. It's anything that informs your work is good to include. And that takes us to the end of the questions, at least in the queue. So I'm gonna use this opportunity to um, pop over and share some more information. But if anything else comes up for you, feel free to drop it in. So, um, yeah, Laura, if you want to talk about our upcoming sessions. Yeah, so I see that you've dropped in that eligibility link um, or call link rather, thanks. Um, so as we mentioned, there's some upcoming info sessions for best, best practices for your work samples as well as live Q&A sessions closer to the deadline um, for info on how to attend information and Q&A sessions go to www.jeromefoundation.org slash events. And there's the link in the chat. Recorded info sessions, including this session and the upcoming work sample session on the 17th, uh, will be captioned and posted to that same events page after they take place. So if you can't attend the live, um, feel free to visit that link to see the recording. Note that Q&A sessions, however, will not be recorded or posted. And then Melissa will share some details about how to get in touch. Well, <laughs> um, 
So yes, you can reach us after today's session if you have questions about your eligibility or if you have more general questions about the fellowship program, you can make a phone call appointment with the program staff um, who are here today. And you can also send your questions by email. Our email addresses are all listed in the fellowship overview. And you can contact Andrea if you have any technical questions or issues with submittable. And over to Eleanor. Uh, to me, <laughs> to remind you that the applications are due Wednesday, May 4th, 2022. And that's at 4 p.m. Central, 5 p.m. Eastern. I, uh, a lot of um, application deadlines are, are due at midnight on submittable. And that's not us. And the reason is because if you submit your application at 4 p.m. or 5 p.m., depending on where you are, that means that we are in the office to help you if you are having a problem with your submission. So uh, I just wanna call out that time to take note of. I think we're, we're, we're at time here. So thank you all for joining us. Uh, we hope this was helpful. This is our, our grand experiment in uh, creating a CV specific um, session. So thank you for joining us. And thanks, L SL. Uh, may the fourth be with you as well. <laughs> <laughs>